So the last two things I want to cover is dates and then exceptions and error handling. Now dates, dates in Java, you had a date time class, or no I'm sorry, you had a date class and then you had the calendar class. In .NET you have a single class for date time. The date time class is a very robust class. It provides you with a whole lot more functionality than probably most people would ever consider even using. Um, it's localized, which means that it is um, environment aware. It knows that it's running on a Windows machine in this case in the Eastern time zone, that it's, you know, daylight savings time is currently occurring this is a certain format that we like to see things in America it's very aware of all of this detail it's not simply storing a bunch of arbitrary numbers so the date time is a class it's not a primitive type um, so you can say date time and we'll call it date val equals and I'll just do date time I'm gonna use a static property of now. So datetime.now pulls the current date time off the machine at the moment that line executes. Stores it in a variable. So it takes a snapshot of time. So what can we learn about this date? So we can say date now We can get, if it's a date and time component together, we can just get the date part from it. So that'll return us month, day, year with a time of 000 for hours, minutes, and seconds, midnight. We can get the day as a number, integer. So, you know, today is the what, 18th, so it'll give us the number 18 back. Uh, we can get the day of the week, it'll tell you if it's Monday, Sunday through Saturday. It will give you the day of year, so it will tell you what day of the 365 days it is. If there's a time component, it will give you the hour. Um, date time kind, date type kind. Let you identify whether it's a local or UTC time. So it helps you identify the type of time it's in there, or the kind of time. You can get the current millisecond stored in there. Minutes, month, second. You can also do math. You can add or subtract dates. Ticks. Um, ticks is a numeric storage um, model for storing date time it actually is derived from the, basically all date time is is a number it's a number starting at a relative point in physical time so the ticks give you you start at zero ticks is it used to be January 1st 1970 because nobody ever assumed you would ever use date and time prior to the invention of the <laughs> standard computer I don't know why they realized very quickly with the Y2K issue that there was also a problem that there are dates that go back prior to 1970 and um, I won't get into all the details. Basically when you ended up with Y2K you ended up with that whole circle back deal. So ticks now start back at like depending on the implementation they start back at 1900 sometimes they start back at the beginning of time quote unquote at zero AD and then there are certain models that implement BC time but they try to start at least at zero so January 1st year zero. Ticks is a measure of that time in I always get this wrong milliseconds I think it's milliseconds don't quote me on that you can look it up in Wikipedia um, <clears throat> It's arbitrary, but it's important. The reason it's important is that Unix stores most of its date time values in ticks. 
So when you go from a Windows machine and you're trying to convert a Unix from a Unix machine or a Linux machine, taking that date time value and converting it over, you often find casting issues because they deal with ticks in a different way. So knowing that is important because if you're, especially if you're crossing time zones of time, you'll want to make sure that you have that factored because they deal with different start dates for their ticks. So kind of arbitrary, but you may run across it and it may be worth knowing that. Um, okay, so we have time of day and the year. And then you'll also notice there's a lot of string conversion options. So you can do to short date, to long date, to short time, to long time, um, to file time, which again has to do with not ticks, but it stores it as a very long number. Um, you can convert it to a binary, which again will just give you a number representation. My favorite, and I must have either missed it or I think it's a static. I think it's a static. Um, so you can add days, hours, minutes, seconds, ticks, years. So you have all this information about the dates. Statics, I think, are more fun. You can do things like is leap year. You throw it a date and it'll tell you if it's a leap year or not. That's kind of fun. Um, parse, parse exact, days in month. So you throw it a year and a month, it'll tell you how many days are in that month. Converting back from those longs and binaries. And then try parse and try parse exact. I believe we talked about the try parse. I don't know if I got into it with dates. I don't recall. Um, basically, you pass it a string and just about any format you can think of and it will do its darndest to try to parse it into a true date time class. So whether you put it in year month day format, um, year day month, month day year, day month year, it will do its best based on the localization. So based on what type of computer it's running on, if it's on a machine that's you know a European install of Windows or it's in that time zone, it will look at that string and it will try to parse it according to what the local region's preferences. So in the US we always do month, day, year. Sometimes we do year, month, day. I know in Europe and other areas they do it day, month, year and the same with the year first. So it'll try to do its best guess. It's not always perfect but it's pretty close. You can help it by putting additional details in there, such as time zones, um, seconds, milliseconds, and then you can even give it hints about different formatting options. So there's a lot of little neat gems inside of the date time class. But in the most simplistic sense, it stores a date, it stores a time. You can do math. If you want to know, if you want to take whatever today is and add a day to it, you just say add day, and it gives you no big deal. Um, it has a neat um, implicit conversion where you can take a date time variable and say plus one and it'll add a day. So we can say date val equals date val plus one. Oh, I took it out. Well, it used to have it. So you can add days. <clears throat> if you're trying to output a string to the console and you want to, or I'm sorry, a date, and you want to format it in a unique way, or you only want a certain segment, you can say date val dot to short date string, or you can say console dot write line. And then you can use what's called string format. 
and these are all noted in your textbook or you can find them on the MSDN and you using date format you use the curly brackets with zero as the argument position so zero first position and then you put in the value that you want to have that replaced with so zero is the first position I got two million parentheses it's going to take the first item after the string and it's going to insert it there so what does that look like the last one is what we're looking at so it's actually taking this full date value we can also use a capital D which would give us the long date string what was that? Is it format, format, what kind of format is? yes so each letter has its own format oh, yes, yes. So D is for long, long date if we do T It'll give a short time. Capital T. Oh, that's not going to work. Will give us a long time with the seconds and the a and p.m. Or if we want to designate our own, we can say month month slash day day slash year hours minutes seconds a and p.m. switch it up. <coughs> Year dash month dash day hour minute seconds. So you have total control over that formatting. So you have to pluck pieces out and then try to put them back together. You can use string format to with these token formatters to set up how you format that day time. So, so day time's not that exciting. Woo! Right. Exceptions and error handling. Try catch blocks, right? We learn try catch blocks. Try, do some work, catch when it blows up. Right? <clears throat> and then good old EX. So the idea here is maybe you're doing a cast. Maybe you're attempting to connect to a SQL database. Maybe you're attempting to read a file. Maybe you're attempting to make an HTTP request to a website. And you know there's an off chance that it might blow up. It may not connect. Early termination of the connection. File is locked. Who knows? So the goal here is wrap it inside of a try catch do your best to think of every scenario where your code may blow up and try to handle it as smoothly as possible. Now smoothly doesn't always mean elegantly. Usually it means it doesn't crash the whole program and I told the user something that they may or may not understand. Elegantly is I capture the error, I silently send myself an email, and I tell the user something happened and I already notify the developer. It's kind of like what Microsoft does when your windows get all crazy and you get that little doo -doo -doo sending you information to Microsoft. That's what that is in a nutshell. Program crashed, doing a package, sending that data off to Microsoft. What kind of data 
can I as the developer capture when a crash occurs? Okay, so let's say that, oh, let's see. So let's say that I want to do a web request. So what does this little block of code do? It goes and establishes a connection to google.com, requests the HTML from that page, captures it, and writes it out to the console. I wrap it in a try block because if my network connection is down, it will make my app blow up. If an error occurs in attempting to run this app, what kind of information can I get back that I can send to myself or at least write to a log file? The exception object has a lot of pretty decent data in it. The base class of any exception is system.exception. Every exception within the framework derives itself from system.exception. the exception is kind of inherent into the framework and provides certain information when an exception is thrown, when an exception object is created. That exception tracks what line in your code was the exception thrown. It will provide you the stack trace of how it got to that point in your code and if implemented correctly will provide you details about the environment of your program when the exception occurred. So if I do something as simple as console.writeline ex.message and I'll put in front of this message I'll do stack trace I'll do a couple of these just to put some space. And if I run, There's the HTML from Java's home page, or Java, Google's home page. HTML <coughs> tag, Java scriptiness, all kinds of good stuff. If I go in. put my laptop in airplane mode turns off my Wi-Fi. 
I'll run it now. It blows up. Can't connect. So the you can't see it, but that exception object message, the remote name could not be resolved. www.google.com. So that's what actually happened. Now, the first thing they attempted to do was resolve the name to an IP address. And it failed. Where did it fail? Well, it failed on the call on the code inside of get response. My program failed in the CPU import program, that's the class, main function inside of this file on line 26. So it's the same thing you get, or similar to what you see in a compile time error, but this is at runtime. So that's the actual line of code where it failed. So if you continuously see this type of an error, it may make you say, okay, maybe there's something wrong situationally about my program. Especially if you see object not set to an instance or no reference or something to that effect. That means that there's a situation, there's a scenario within your application where somebody is or isn't clicking something and it's causing a particular variable in your program to not get set, which is then causing an exception to occur. So it may be as simple as that, is it's a logic flow issue in your program where a certain variable that you're expecting to be set is never getting set. And you'll find that, especially in your C-sharp programming, when you have events and you're dealing with events and you're dealing with classes and object instances that are inside of repositories, You're going to find where you declared a variable, you assumed that something got set inside of that variable, and then on the button click, all of a sudden, that variable is empty. And you'll get a null reference exception. The stack trace is very helpful because you can see not always every command, but you can kind of follow the path of, okay, it did this, and then it did this, and then it did this, and then it ended up at this point in my code but it never made it to block X. And I expected block X to run and then it to get to this point to initialize that variable. So the stack traces are very helpful. <coughs> what other information can you get that may be of value to you? Outside of the exception object, there is the environment class. The environment class provides you with all kinds of information about the environment that your application is running within. It'll give you the current directory. It'll give you the exit code. It'll give you the name of the machine. It'll tell you if it's running as a 64-bit process or not. It'll tell you if the operating system it's running on is a 64-bit operating system. OS version, processor count. You can get stack trace information also from the environment, which, believe it or not, is where the exception gets it from. <laughs> You can get the name of the user who's logged in running your program. So a lot of, you know, relatively useful information. Um, there's also additional information. Maybe it was part of the environment. I missed it. Oh, off of the process class, which lives under system.diagnostics. Maybe it's process info.
you can call it get current process. So let me create process p equals get current process, and then p. You can again get the exit code, exit time, machine information, the modules that are running within the process. So if you have multiple DLL files loaded within your application, you can see what modules are running. Paging information, peak memory usage, process name, processor affinity, the amount of memory your program is using at the time. You can get startup parameter information, what arguments were passed to your program when it ran. You can get time of when the program started. So if maybe this is actually not a command line app, it's not a Windows app, but it's a web service or server app. You want to know how long has this thing been running when it crashed? Was it running for a day? Was it running for a year? You can capture that information as well. Capture all of the threads that are running. So there's a lot of information, a lot of diagnostic information that you can capture on an exception. More than what you just get from the exception object. The exception object also contains inner exceptions. So you can actually nest exceptions together. I often will do this where I will take some sort of a specialized exception and maybe I want to I have I want to tr bubble an exception up but I want to protect it. I don't want it to have oh error occurred while connecting to the SQL server or blah 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 blah. I don't want that information to make it up to the user. So instead what I'll do is I'll say throw new application exception application exception is a class in its simplistic form it takes two parameters a string which is the error and then you can pass another exception object as the inner exception so I can say error loading site ex. So if I F5 and run, it'll actually blow up. I'll get an error because I threw this exception. Now, what the exception says is error loading site. If I stop it and run it again without debug, And then it tries to report my error to Microsoft. <laughs> but the error that comes out is unhandled exception, application exception, <coughs> error loading site. And it tells me again that it occurred on line 27. But this is the inner exception. And this is actually my throw on line 41. I could protect this, and if I wanted to rethrow and catch, I could just write out my my application exception, but I can log the inner exception because that's what I, as the developer, care about. I want the user to know one thing, ideally not giving them all the keys to the kingdom. You may run across websites where you put something in incorrectly, it blows up, you get the salmon screen of death <coughs> or something, and it spits out, oh, by the way, here's the address and potentially username and password to the SQL database that it's trying to connect to. You erase the line with all the system exceptions. It used to be the line that you erase that. That is set to the right of system parameters for the system exception. I'll keep it. It's there now. <laughs> Just easier. That's all right. No problem. So, whenever you have a 
a low level exception and you don't want to let you know throw out the baby with the bath water and give away the keys to the kingdom and let people know how to connect to your SQL server. I recommend always wrapping SQL exceptions, file system exceptions, inside of try catch, throw your own application exception. Now, I'm not required to throw an inner exception. I could take ex, I could log it, and then I could throw another error completely arbitrary. I could just simply say, new, throw new application exception, error loading site, run again, Microsoft tries to fix it for me, So if I comment these two lines out, run it again, then that's all that gets output now. Error loading site. Okay. <clears throat> you can also create your own exception classes. So if you have a specific scenario where you have an error that's always happening, it's always occurring, you can't figure it out just from the stack trace. You want to capture environment information. You can create your own exception class, and it's just a class. So add new class, blows up exception, and you have to inherit from the base class exception. Just like any other class, you give it properties, you give it a constructor. Um, string domain. String domain. Domain equals domain. Now you may be saying, where did inner exception come from? Why one of them said it? Inner exception is coming from the inheritance of the exception base class. Now this property is read only. I can't set it. So what I have to do instead is I have to do colon base domain enter ex. I can then come back to my program and say this is a blows up exception. So I can then put in here that that's my domain. I have five. No, I should have ran without debug. Now all it says is that exception of type CP week four blows up exception was thrown. Doesn't give any details to the console, but 
in theory, we could throw that in a method, catch it somewhere else, and in that catch, unpack that information, sort in a log or email it off or whatever we need to do to log that exception. And that can all be done packaging that data inside of that exception object. So if you had something very complex where maybe you had student data, staff data, course data, you have all these pieces, some data is coming from one system, some data is coming from another system, and all of a sudden you just end up with a null reference, and you're like, null reference, what thing <laughs> of all these five things is null? You create a special exception class, you give it five properties, one for each type, and then when that exception occurs, you package up all those variables and you store them in that exception object. And then you unpack that exception object and you save it to your log. So when that exception occurs, you know, did I have student data? Did I have class data? Did I have teacher data? Did I have this data? Did I have this data? And you figure out which one of them is null. So then when you run through and you see it again, you make some adjustments, you try to handle it or capture additional details that help you figure out you know, is there a piece of data missing in the database? Is it the way that I'm pulling data in? Is it formatted in a way that I'm not parsing correctly? You have all these different things that you may be dealing with. So trying to understand the environment of your code when it's running and when you get an error is very important. Using exception objects and correct error handling can help you identify and correct those problems. Your stack traces, again, this was like a one line stack trace. Um, if you'd like to see a real one, oh, I have to turn on my internet. I'm sure, I have one floating in here somewhere. So there's a real stack trace from real code. So digging through all of that and figuring out where the exception actually occurs and how to account for it, it's good to have a lot of detail. Something that we haven't talked about um, up to this point, and I'm going to save it for a later lecture, is the idea of unit testing. Unit testing, I don't know, has anybody ever done any unit testing? Had to run into a unit test environment? Okay. So the basic idea behind unit testing is you write code that goes through and tests these situations. You try to be proactive about it. You think of what's a real world situation? So you write a piece of code that emulates the real world. That is basically, you write another project that calls your production code, and it goes through these batteries of tests, and it expects certain things. Well, within Visual Studio, there's a, a very decent testing framework where you basically go in and say, run these tests. And it runs all these methods doing this work. And when exceptions are thrown or assertions fail, it will come back and say whether your code is good or bad. It tests it for you. So something that may actually take you weeks or days or hours to test by hand, it can do it in a matter of minutes to hours depending on the size of the project. So unit tests can be cumbersome for small projects, but it can be huge lifesavers for very large ones. Um, I'm just going to give you a taste of it in the closer to the end of the term. It's not important at this point in time, but it's definitely something I want you to at least be aware of. You will see it again if you continue on and you go into the ASP.NET MVC course. We will cover that in a lot more detail and you will see it being used because it's one of the, it's a fundamental tool in doing MVC ASP.NET development because it helps you really test your deployments and make sure that you've got good working code. So good stuff. Okay, so